Are you a classical pianist who likes to branch out into popular music every now and then? Well, stay tuned for some tips on how to do it. This is something I had to do quite a number of years ago when I needed to earn some extra money as a student. Are you sitting comfortably? Then let's begin. Hi, this is Tommy with Tommy's Piano Corner, the place for returning pianists, or indeed anybody who loves piano, to share tips and ideas of how to get the best from this great hobby. If it's your first trip here, then do please consider subscribing. Simply click the little icon in the bottom right hand corner of your screen now, and it's all done for you. Being a classically trained pianist who's learned in the traditional way using largely classical music, then of course making the transition to popular music isn't always so easy. We're taught, for example, that we need to follow the dots on the page precisely and with a great deal of reverence when we play. Equally, we're not taught so much about chords and how these may relate to each other. And of course, as for improvisation, probably nothing could be further from our minds. Yet I think that when we play popular music, we can finally be liberated from a lot of these rules that govern the way we play as classical pianists. But yet we can still bring our pianistic skills to bring to life the music that we enjoy playing. Perhaps for me, one of the first things to take into consideration when playing popular music is that we're no longer bound to follow the score religiously. Of course, there are some things that would be a shame to change, such as Stephen Hoff's arrangement of my favourite things. But in general, the arrangements are just arrangements, and therefore, if we choose to, we can simply use the music in front of us as a rough guide of what we'd like to play. Initially, of course, this can be a lot more difficult to do than it sounds. I mean, we're taught, even when sight reading, that we should follow exactly what's there to neither add nor omit anything, to neither simplify nor embellish. And now that's a habit that we need to start trying to break. I think, basically, we just need to switch our thinking a little bit and realise that we no longer need to be learning how to play something exactly as it's written. I think by taking a more, shall we say, relaxed approach to following the score, we're able to approach the piece of music that we want to play in a different way. This is where a good knowledge of chords comes in really helpful for us, and for a couple of reasons. First, of course, with a lot of popular music, when you buy it, the chords are actually already written in for you. This then means that if we've got a good grasp of chords, we can largely really just ignore the music completely and maybe just follow the melody line and fill in the rest for ourselves. Alternatively, if we're using a very simple arrangement, then we can actually use our knowledge of chords to add notes in and make it more interesting as we play. So basically, we can try to make things either as simple or as complicated as we want. Take, for example, this arrangement of memory from Cats. Now, we could, of course, just play it exactly as written, like this. Alternatively, if we're not so confident with our left hand, then we can really miss out a lot of the left hand notes and play it more like this to make it simpler. Then of course, if we want to make it sound richer and fuller, we can just add notes in with either our left or our right hands. Now I published some videos on how to get better at recognising chords if this is something that you've not really learned too much yet and I've linked that playlist below for you. Secondly, an enormous amount of music is also made available quite affordably as lead sheets. You might have also heard the expression fake books, which are basically just books full of lead sheets. Now I've explained this before in one of my other videos that I've linked here for you, but basically all a lead sheet is, is the melody written out as normal musical notation with 
the chords written above it. Basically, in these cases, the pianist actually needs to add the entire accompaniment by themselves on the fly, so to speak. This might initially sound difficult to do, but as you get more comfortable with chords, you'll find that actually it's remarkably simple. I mean, let's take the left hand alone, for example. Now, we might choose to just play simple block chords with our left hand because that's nice and easy, or even just the root bass note with our left hand. As we get more advanced, we can then start adding arpeggios and all sorts of other different patterns with the left hand to make the music more interesting. We can even add octaves right deep down at the bottom of the piano for drama and atmosphere. Then, of course, let's look at the right hand. When we're first starting out, just playing the melody along with our right hand is probably perfectly fine. As we get better, we can start adding some of the notes from the chords to the right hand so that we're playing part of the accompaniment in the right hand as well as the left hand. And then as we progress more, why not play the melody, for example, in octaves? Or even more advanced, in thirds or in sixths? Of course, this is just the start. If we wanted, for example, to prepare a bit of a party piece using a piece of popular music that we love, then we can acquire some new skills, add these to that music, and create something that's really quite nice. For example, a really good trick that I've used over the years is what I call two-handed arpeggios. And these are relatively easy to play, but look and sound quite good when people watch and listen. And all you're really doing is playing the notes with your left hand that you've just played with your right hand. When I play Misty, I generally play it like this simply because in the melody there are quite a few notes that are sustained for quite a while and of course you need something to fill in the gaps and this works wonders. Alternatively, we can also use some of our classical training to embellish the music that we're playing by using things like trills and mordants. You can spread these into the music quite easily, and given the amount of hours that we've had to spend perfecting them when we've learned Bach or Chopin, why not put them to good use elsewhere? And we can also steal ideas from some of our favourite classical pieces. For example, in my teens, I realised that when I was playing Feelings, I could use part of the right hand from the second cadenza in Liszt Liebstraum number no. 3. And that just made a bit of movement within the piece while I was playing. It sounded quite flashy, but I thought so at the time. And given that I'd already spent a lot of time working on it, it was something that actually wasn't that, that difficult for me to do. Of course, this then means when we're practicing this type of music, we're no longer focusing on learning a specific sequence of notes and drilling that sequence endlessly until it becomes perfect. Rather, now when we practice, we're actually thinking more about improvisation. Now, I'm not talking necessarily about the jazz improvisation of improvising the melody over the accompaniment. I'm simply talking about making up the accompaniment as we go along rather than trying to learn it in a, as a specific set of notes. Our practice time's now spent more exploring things, trying things out, seeing what works, seeing what doesn't. And if we come up with a good idea that sounds great, then we can simply write it onto either our music or our lead sheet. If you're not already, then please do subscribe to Tommy's Piano Corner. Click on that little bell icon so you're notified of new videos as and when they're released. I thank you very much for watching and I'll see you next week.